Dependency and independency. What are they? As parents, as carers, as teachers, children and young people's workers, how do we support our children and work to become more independent and productive and responsible citizens? That is the topic we're looking at today. Do we promote our children's independence or do we enable them to become dependents or to be dependent on us all the time? Hi, everybody. Good evening. Welcome to our 20th show. This is a milestone for us. 20th episode of Families Grow Together show. It is amazing. And I'm so excited to be here this evening to come and share with you, with Nelly, and praying that it is going to be a fun show. It's going to be informative as usual, and that we are all going to participate, contribute, and learn from one another. Hi, Nelly. Welcome. Hi, Aqua. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming on our show today. <laughs> Thank you for coming on our show today. I am Nelly Kwasungwe, a transformational life coach with a background as a social worker with children and families. So welcome today. Our topic for today is, as parents, are you promoting your children or child's independency or dependency? Have your papers ready to take down notes and please share your comments and ask questions so we can learn from each other. So as we start at the back of your mind, just have this, children will become what they are told they are. So our words, what we tell our children makes a lot of sense to the children because they will live by that. This quote is by Dorothy Delay. Just keep that at the back of your head. So for today, what we are going to cover is, what is dependency? Signs that someone or your child or yourself is dependent. What is independency? The signs of independency. Reactions of children who are prevented from being independent. And how to promote our children's independency. So we have loads to cover today. And you'll just bear with me, my screen just misbehaves and misbehaves. So we'll go with that. So let's start. What does it mean by dependency? I'll just give a brief definition by Cambridge Dictionary. It's a situation in which a person needs something or someone and are unable to continue without them or without that thing. For example, some parents treat their children as if they are infants or babies to the extent that the children start believing in their parents and believing what the parents say about them. And as a result, the children develop the mindset that they are babies, they are infants, and they keep them permanently at the state of dependency. So this one just relates to the quote that I started off with. So then what are the signs that you, your child, your children, or someone you know are dependent on others? There are many different factors. I will, you know what, this my screen is just, when, it, when my screen gets bad, I'll just be talking without the, without the screen and you'll see just Aqua, they've been silent. So some of the signs that, uh, some of the signs of, of dependency is people have difficulties making everyday decisions without advice or reassurance. They need others to assume responsibility. So they shy away from taking responsibility on things that they need to do. They have difficulty when having disagreement. And all of this is because of fear. 
sometimes they turn to police people because they don't want to get into any disagreement, even if the pleasing people is to their disadvantage. They struggle to start projects or to do things, to take initiative because they want some other person to give them that reassurance that, yeah, you go ahead, it's all right. They fear rejection. They make themselves responsible when bad things happen. So again, it's that issue of blame. They blame themselves and they are unable to create or defend personal boundaries because again, pleasing people. So they struggle with setting boundaries and maintaining boundaries because they fear that rejection from other people. So then what is independency? So independency, <clears throat> excuse me. So independency is when a child or an individual gains a sense of importance and belonging. They feel they are able to contribute to the world and social life around them. Independent people will dare to make differences in the world throughout the ages. So they believe or they focus on their beliefs, their values, and they know that they have something valuable to contribute in this lifetime. When you guide your independent tendency in a positive direction, you will benefit yourself and others around you. So we'll go on to the signs that someone is independent. Independent people can do most tasks without assistance. This doesn't mean that they don't ask for help when they need it. They will take the initiative to do or to start things. But then when they feel that they are stopped, they don't stay there. They go and ask for assistance or for help on that particular aspect. Independent people are incredibly driven because they are focused, they know they have a lot to contribute to our society. They prefer to do things alone because they think they are creative, they are curious. But again, when they get stuck, they ask for help. They are internally strong. They say things the way they are. They can be really assertive and they might fall out with people, but they don't mind about that because they know they have their intentions to make a positive contribution. They keep an open mind. They are open to learn even when they make mistakes. If they make mistakes, it's not that they are a failure. It's just a learning opportunity for them. And they want to do things their own way. So then, do you know someone who is independent or who portrays some of those signs or symptoms? <laughs> so the reactions of children who are prevented to be independent, I strongly believe that every parent always wants the best from their children. However, certain fears prevent the parents from promoting their children's independency. Some can be intentional, some, some can be not intentional. So then what are the reactions when children are prevented to be independent? Children, when children are prevented from gaining independence, they may react with anger and resistance because they know their rights are being violated because they know they can do things but they are being prevented. That can be called the phase of opposition. And this, I'll just relate it to one of the um, topics that we did a couple of weeks ago on teenagers because we have that phase that teenagers are oppositional, probably because they are being prevented to be independent. It's just an example. So children may also react with feelings of abandonment, rejection, and develop a seemingly 
indifferent attitude. Probably they will, develop, they will display behaviors that no one in the family or no one around them has displayed. It's important to know that developing autonomy also gives a child the sense of self-efficacy and promotes self-esteem and confidence. So then as parents, how do you promote your child's independence? There are a lot of them, but I'll mention just a few. So start off by setting healthy boundaries. And it's not just a one-off. When you set those boundaries, maintain them. You need to be the role model. Show the example because children will easily copy what they see because children learn from observation. Whereas if you tell a child, do this, do that, it is highly likely they will not do that, but they will do exactly what you do. Create and keep routines. Routines are very important because it helps children, it helps individuals to regulate for self-regulation. So maintain or create and keep a routine. Take time in your busy schedule to talk and listen. It is so common for parents to get so busy, especially in this world that we are so, so super busy, not to have time to talk to our children. But as our children's role models, we need to create that time because what will the children learn if we are not there to teach them? Obviously, they will learn, but the thing is they will learn from other sources and most probably there will be sources that parents do not like or promote. Teach simple rules around safety. It could be safety or any kind of safety, like safety uh, crossing the road, safety while at home, safety in general. Assign responsibility. Engage children in household chores, but this needs to be age appropriate. Get them engaged in activities like cooking, like doing the laundry, let them do something you are teaching them bit by bit to know how to do certain things, even like cooking, making a cup of tea, making hot drinks, even cold drinks. That is giving them responsibilities. They are learning so that when they get to a certain age, they can do that independently without the parent supervising them. They can care for their siblings. It doesn't mean that the parent just leave the older siblings to care for the younger ones. No, it could be supervised. Again, it depends on the child's age. Have, give your children time to socialize. They don't need to be only in the house with you, the parents, because obviously parents will have their own things doing and children will also want to do their own things. Allow them to adventure. Children are so adventurous. Give them that time to go and play, even if it's messy play, let them adventure, feel safe for the messy play. Let them feel how nice it is to rub themselves in the mud or anything like that. Though the parents will have the responsibility to do the washing after, but it is the emotional aspect that is really, really important for the children. So teach your child to become independent. So overall, what we've looked at, I know this is a very quick one, but overall, what we've looked at is, what is dependency? The signs of dependency. What is independency and the signs? And the reaction of children who are prevented to be independent and how parents or adults can promote children's independency. So thank you so much for that aqua. And that is what I have for, for you today. Thank you, Melly. That was short and sweet. <laughs> <laughs>
the yes. way you like it the way i like it <laughs> straight to the point like the independent person that i am and <laughs> just testify that i am one of those independent people who likes to do things by themselves so <laughs> he diagnosed me just right <laughs> right okay so thank you for that um yes as parents and as carers and as um practitioners professionals we as our job is to guide our children or the children that we look after to become more independent there is the, the parenting is not about keeping the children at home parenting is about equipping our children to go out into the society to be responsible and to contribute to the well-being of everyone else in the society so if they're not independent they're constantly dependent on you then they're not going to be able to do what they need to do to fulfill their purpose and to enjoy life like you are so a, a, a lot of us parents who are very i'll say clingy to our children who are very protective are, are those who rebelled a lot who wanted the independence that we are trying to hold our children tight and keeping them from so thank you Nelly, for that you, you, you talked about the science of of, of dependency not being uh, um, confident enough to to to, to take uh, uh, important decisions always asking and needing reassurance and approval from other people when it comes to making big decisions or important decisions in, in their lives sometimes the children are even going and making a cup of tea or toast sometimes they're scared of doing that if they do not come and ask for permission if they do not come and say mom dad can i do this they're so dependent on us it is incredible so yes, we're going to have a, some points of discussion and how we can promote independence in our children. So you gave us some few uh, um, examples there, and I would like you to expound on the on the first one that you gave us: setting healthy boundaries. What do you mean by setting healthy boundaries? What what are what are boundaries? Are you going to build a fence around the child? What do you mean by boundaries? <laughs> Okay, thank you for that question, Aqua. So boundaries is anything. <laughs> so it's like, if you want say, your, wait, let me just, so for boundaries is what you would like your children, your members of your household to do to respect each other. So if you want say healthy, healthy boundaries, like, children don't swear in, 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 in the home. That is a healthy boundary. If you want the children to be respectful of each other, if you want the children to take their clothes and put in the dirty basket or in the washing machine or keep their room tidy, those are boundaries for things that children will do. When they are doing it, they are reducing the burden for the parent. But again, the children are learning because it's helping them with their self-regulation. It helps children to delay their gratification because if they want something, like we've said in the previous session, children want things and they want them immediately. But if you set boundary and a child comes to you and say, mom, dad, can I have this? And you say, yes, you can have it, but not straight away. That's a boundary. And one thing uh, that uh, boundaries are very important is not just setting the boundaries because I have seen a lot of cases where parents set a boundary, but because the child or the children become disruptive, since they cannot have what they are requesting for at that time, parents give in. Yes, parents have set the boundaries, but they have not maintained the boundaries. So that gives a lot of confusion to the child because the child learns that if they want something and they ask the parents and the parent says no, they will have they'll display tantrums. And because they have learned that if they display the tantrum, the parent will give in to their request. So that is not a, a way of maintaining healthy boundaries because you are just helping to confuse the child. And before you know it, this child's behavior will be the one that 
you struggle to manage. So boundaries are anything simple that you put in place for yourself to maintain and for the children to maintain, to promote that good relationship within the household. Okay, thank, well, thank you, you. Right, so yes, you said boundaries are, could be classified as rules. Yeah. yeah, there could be rules, there could be guidelines that you put in place or maybe a contract that you have in the household. What is acceptable and what is not acceptable, depending on how you have set it up in your own home, isn't it? Or in school or in a play center or whatever place you find yourself where there are rules and regulations for us to follow. Yeah. Right. So it comes with rights and it comes with responsibilities, I would say, because as parents, we are responsible to provide for our children, provide shelter, provide food, provide uh, um, the basic needs, education and all that kind of stuff. But these rights that they have to have these things come with responsibilities. Now, there's certain things that we cannot deprive our children of. We cannot deprive them of food, water to drink, but we can put boundaries in place so that if you don't do your side of the bargain, then there are consequences, obviously, because these boundaries are meant for their own protection. It's like guardrails on the road. You put guardrails on the road to prevent uh, accidents or to reduce the, the, the damage that happens in the, an accident occurs. So boundaries are, are guardrails therefore for the, the, our children's protection and uh, for us to understand what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. Now, when do we start putting these boundaries in place? It's a question for you. Okay. Lady. Thank you, Aqua. See, boundaries, we start, it's good to start putting boundaries as early as possible. For instance, let me say, if a child is, say, a week old, and say the child starts crying, and they realize that when they cry, the parent does not attend to them. We think that as children, as babies, they don't understand, but they start learning. And at that very early stage, they learn trust and mistrust whether they can depend or they can rely on their caregiver. So boundaries is something that you start very early on. Let's say a child is a week old and they cry. Probably you have checked them and they are, there's nothing wrong with them. But then the child probably wants you to pick them up. It's up to you, the parent, your choice. Do you want to pick up that child every time the child cries, then you are teaching the child that when they cry, they will be picked up. But if you say, if you know that your child or your baby, all their needs are being met and they are crying for that attention to be picked up, you might set a boundary that you will give them some time to understand that, yes, they are crying, they need attention, but they, they have all that they need is you give them like one, two minutes to find before you attend to them, but you need to make sure that the child is safe, that the child is not um, crying because they need something else. Probably they need their nappies changing or hunger or all one. You need, need to check on that. And once you know that the child wants to be picked up, start putting boundaries. And as the child goes older, change the boundaries, let the boundaries be age appropriate. I will just share an example here of one of the cases that I worked with. This girl was a teenager and she had learned that when she asks for her phone, because she always wanted to be on her phone, when she asked for her phone and her mom refused, she will thrash the house down she will pull anything that is around her. She'll run to the kitchen, push down cups, glasses, just smash whatever she, she can. Because she knows that from the first time she did that or she exhibited that behavior, her mom quickly gave her the phone 
And obviously she learned that thrashing down the house means her mom will respond to her immediately. So then when I went and I was working with this, this uh, teenager and I asked, where did that come from? And she explained that since her mom will not respond to her anywhere else, but when she smashes down the house straight away. So then we had to, or I helped her to put in place something else for this child to realize that she is causing damage to property and her mom spends money to replace whatever she has smashed. So boundaries are to be, you start boundaries very early on and you monitor and evaluate and change them as the child grows because their needs change. Thank you. Thank you, Nelly. That is so true. It's important that we start realizing uh, to start putting these boundaries in place early. And like you said, children will find a way of getting their needs met, whether by manipulation, begging, crying, <laughs> throwing a fit, or smashing the house like the extreme case that you just shared. Because when children want attention, it doesn't matter what kind of attention that they're getting, whether positive or negative, attention is attention to a child. So it, as parents, we need to le learn to know our and understand our children and to learn to meet their needs time in a timely and appropriate manner because some of these things happen when children feel neglected, unheard, or not listened to. And so they try and get their needs met in a negative sense. So it's important that we uh, start putting these boundaries in place as young as possible. And like you said earlier, consistency is key. Because if we, today we're saying, okay, if they smack you, and you, you're stern with them and say no, and then the next day they smack you, you laugh at it, oh, so cute. What are you teaching that child? In their brain, you're scrambling their brain. Because one minute is good, one minute is bad. They do not understand what is going on. So it's important to keep your... Uh, um, Put your set your boundaries and maintain them and be consistent in your in, 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 in how you maintain the boundaries. So if, if you decided that you're rewarding with a sticker today for this behavior, then be consistent with the reward. If you're rewarding with a, a little toy, then be consistent with that toy. Don't 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 give this uh, uh, little uh, reward for, for 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 a massive be a, a positive action and then the next time the child does a tiny thing you give or a, a massive uh, or a massive thing you, you reward uh, inappropriately so it is important to be consistent and if you you guys can have a contract like Nelly says all the time you guys can have a contract set it in stone write it down these are your responsibilities these are the rewards you get from taking care of these responsibilities and if you do not take care of your responsibilities these are the consequences. And so if it is set already in stone, then when somebody doesn't do their part of the bargain and the consequences come, they have no voice to, 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 to complain about. You have to bear the consequences. Obviously, parents are sometimes you can be merciful, obviously. We're not saying that be so rigid that <laughs> your children think that you are the devil himself. So we have to be flexible with our, 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 our boundaries, but make sure that it is in a we're very consistent in how we enforce things. Right, so you said something uh, um, about making and keeping routines. That's one of the things that a lot of us struggle with, a lot, especially when we have young ones. I work with uh, children and families, and one of the biggest issues that uh, they call me out for is sleep. Maintaining that, <laughs> that sleep routine, establishing a sleep routine. Because when children are in the early, when in those young years, and they're not going to nursery or to school, sometimes parents think, ah, oh, there's no need to start a little routine. They're not going anywhere in the morning, so they can sleep at midnight and get up whenever. After all, they're staying at home. And then when it comes to starting to go to school, they're so engrossed in these habits that so, Nelly, 
what would you advise? Are routines good for just young babies, like the ones that I work with, or are they for everybody, children, teenagers, adults, everyone? What would you say to that? I would say a routine is good for everyone. The young, the adults, the elderly, everyone. Because like you talked of sleep, I would just say tomorrow is World Sleep Day. And I was doing some research on sleep. Sleep is very, very important. It says a range of sleep for babies is around 14 to 17 hours a day. And up to teenagers, about 10 hours a day. And then for adults. So maintaining routines is very important. Why did I go to sleep routine? Because like you said, that is something that parents, not just parents, even teenagers, young people, a lot of the different age range, they struggle to maintain sleep. And some people would say, I can just wing it. But if you look at the impact of sleep deprivation, you would not believe because it affects a lot of aspects in your life. Even the way you feel, you might experience mood swings because you did not sleep. It can even affect, it affects a lot of things. So what advice I'll give to parents is to maintain their routines. I'll talk particularly with sleep routine because there are many kinds of routine. You have like mealtime routine, but I'll focus on sleep routine because it's very, very important. So evaluate the time that those in your household go to bed. If younger children can go to bed earlier, then those who are a bit older can go later. Because when the younger children are asleep, they might struggle to wake up because of the noise from the older ones. But again, when the older ones are going to bed, it's good to tell them to be gentle so they don't uh, wake up the others. And I think one thing to insist is the importance of sleep to everyone in the household. Have a bedtime routine. There are various reasons why people struggle to sleep. For instance, being on your phone or watching TV just before bedtime deprives you. It, you will not fall asleep straight away. So things like that, keep your phone away. Don't watch the TV about two hours before bedtime. For children or even for adults, if you realize that you struggle to sleep, probably it's too hot, it's too cold, whatever it is. You can try like having a bath or a shower just before you get to bed. So you are fresh, you are, you feel relaxed. that you are that, yeah, fresh and relaxed. You might, as an adult, you might have a quiet time to reflect on your day. When you do that over time, your mind will start to notice that when you have that quiet time to reflect on your day, it means that you are getting ready for bed. You might have meditation routine that before you go to bed, you have meditation or you have prayers, probably family prayer time or just story time, many different things that you can put in place. When you do that over time, automatically your body will start adapting into that. We've heard of something called a circadian rhythm. So your body will be getting into that without you even telling or reminding yourself that it's nearly bedtime. So those are just some of the few um, advice that I can give to parents to maintain bedtime routine. And then as well as other routines is for you to look at what is suitable within your family. But when you set those uh, routines, be consistent, maintain them, and over time, you will reap the benefits. Thank you, Nelly. And that is the key word. Over time, you will reap the benefits. Because what are we looking at today? How to promote independence 
in our children. And as such, when we set these rules, when we set these boundaries, when we, make, we, we, we create these routines when they are young, then they'll follow those routines by themselves eventually. Yeah, because they are, as you said, the second uh, the, the, the second year rhythm will set in, their bodies will know that 7 p.m. is my bedtime, and they'll start feeling sleepy at seven. I know of families where when it's seven, seven, when it's bedtime, it's the child who comes and pulls to the parents that bedtime, mommy, bedtime, daddy, and they go upstairs, they read their book, their stories, and they go to sleep. So what we want to do is to promote that independence in our children so that they recognize themselves that this is the time for this, it's bath time, it is bedtime, or it's meal time, or whatever time it is, what for whatever routine that you have set. So it is very important for us to maintain routines, especially for children. Because, and they need, they need that guidance. The thing is, children may push back at boundaries, but they're not pushing back because they want to be totally free of, of any rules and, and regulate or rules and guidance in the house. It's because that is a natural thing to do as human beings, we push boundaries. But when you push back and you give them that guidance, they are more, they feel secure. Because if you if if you don't if they don't have that guidance and they think that they can do whatever, they don't feel protected. The protection is not there. They need to know that okay, I may push these boundaries, but when it can when it, it becomes dangerous, my parents are there to guide and and, 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 and and protect me. Because if you're not there, if the child wants, if you allow the child to do just whatever they want, eventually they'll run riot because they know that. What I do, it doesn't matter what I do. My parents don't even care. They don't even bother whether I am safe or not. I can take as many risks as I want. Nobody's gonna ask me any question because when I was younger, I did this and nobody questioned me. So when I'm older, if I start doing it, why would they question me? You have not been there throughout. So it's important that we, for our own children's security, for them to know that they are loved and are cared for we need to set those boundaries. And sometimes parents think that allowing a child to just be free and do whatever means that you love them too much. No, you do not. That is not love. Love disciplines. Love sets guide, uh, guidelines. Love sets boundaries. So it's important that uh, we, we think about this, especially as we're looking at their independence. So. If I can just add something there, yeah. Mm -hmm. Not maintaining boundaries is easy for parents because when the child, say, behaves in an, a way that the parents don't like, they're just giving, it's easier. Yes, it solves the, the immediate solution. But then in the long run, the parent and the child or the children will really struggle because the child has not learned um, to discipline themselves mm. so they will get angry even on things that they can manage because that was not there before and when say a child does not want to respect their routine it's good for parents to ask have that open conversation create that time to talk and listen because most of I always talk, when I always talk, I refer back to African parents. Most African parents will be like, I have told you this, you need to do it without even listening to the child. So create that time to talk and listen. And it's better to listen more because when you listen, your child feels that their voice or their views are valued. And it helps them with their sense of worth because they feel that, Yes, their parents will always uh, be there for them. It doesn't mean that their parents will always support them when they do wrong things. And that's what children will easily differentiate because everyone has a capacity to manipulate. When you start um, not maintaining those boundaries, children easily, easily pick on the weaknesses of each of their parents and they will work on that and they will manipulate each parent to the maximum. Yes, that's so true. And like you said, uh, you said about listening. Listening is important. Like you said the, the typical, some, a critical thing there. You do it because I told you so. That is what we say. Why? Because I said, why? I have told you that. 
you know, we come down hard and we get angry, we manipulate with anger. Whereas if you, like you say, you said the critical thing about listening. Personally, if I am given a task to do and I don't understand why I'm doing the task, I'm not gonna do any great job with it, even at work. If you just tell me that this is what we're doing, I'll do the bare minimum. I don't see why I'm going to put my, myself uh, over and above when I don't know why I'm doing it. I'm not expending my energy unnecessarily. It may not be consciously, it could be subconsciously, you just rebel without even realizing. Why am I doing it? So it is important to explain our, to our children why it is important for them to have these boundaries, why it is important to maintain routines, why it is important to, to, to study, to do your homework and all these things. And then they can make an informed choice. If you study, you have a potential of having good grades, potential of, 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 of becoming an entrepreneur or making a big job or whatever, but it is a choice that you have to make. So the certain things that we cannot decide for you, especially as teenagers and young adults, you have to be independent. You have to make these decisions. You have to make choices which have consequences. So we can, as parents, we can decide for the younger ones, but as they're growing older, they're becoming older, we involve them in the decision-making process. And like you said, so that they, they can feel valued, so that they know that they have a voice. And as for helping them develop and, and engaging in these decision-making processes with promoting their independence, because they know that they can make a choice and their choices matter. And so you're building that confidence and self-esteem, uh, 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 self, self, self resilience, and, 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 and promoting critical thinking in them. So it's important that we do these things. You wanna add anything to that? Yeah. I think there, like getting children involved at very early ages, like sometimes I think you know this much better than me, but sometimes we think that children, babies do not understand, but they do. Give them that choice. You can say, even a child who doesn't speak, you can say, what dress do you want to wear today? Yellow or pink? Just show them because they don't respond because they don't have that physical ability to do, but they know that there's something going on because children who say want to start picking their clothes, they really know what they want. Again, it depends on how responsive the child is, but give them that option. Even if you tell them and they don't respond to it, the way that you can understand, but the truth is they indicate, even if they look in a way that a, a response they've given you, but you might miss that out, but they respond as they are growing older. Even if they don't know how to speak yet, give them, let them know you make it like something you do all the time that, okay, do you want to eat toast or sandwich? You are giving them that choice. So let them decide what they want. So you are getting them involved and they are feeling valued because in a way you are asking their opinion. And when you ask for children's opinion, even adults' opinion, they feel that, oh, I, I am worthy. And most people, adults, children alike, their sense of worth is significantly reduced because they just tell them, you do this, without even understanding why they have to do it. And no one takes that time to find out how they feel about that particular thing. So let's make it a habit from as young as we can, or the age of the child, just to make it a habit that we show them, we give them that choices. So as they're growing older, they will know that that is something that their parents or their caregivers or those around them do and they feel that oh I'm valued they ask me what I want to do <laughs> yes that is so true Nelly you, you said something that is critical P babies babies can choose babies can definitely choose because if you put two toys in front of a baby you put say this pen two different pens in front of them they will look at both and you see the heads move and then they'll fixate on one, or they'll reach out to get one. 
And then that is a choice that they've made. And even if they cannot use their words, communicate most of our, 90% of, of our communication is non-verbal anyway. And so if you involve them in the daily routines and the daily decision-making process, you're building in them that sense of importance, that sense of uh, uh, value that they know that, okay, I have agency, I can contribute. And obviously our topic is creating independence in our children. And as such, it starts from young. And as an NAS practitioner, I see this every day. You go into a family home, you're going to assess a child and the two, three, and they cannot eat independently because parents feed them. They cannot dress themselves up, or at least the basics, because we have not given them the opportunity to dress themselves up, especially when we are working parents. You get up in the morning, you're rushing, 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 rushing. You just say, come here. Get in, get in the bath, I'm cleaning. You, you do everything for them just to make the process shorter. And in the process of, in the course of doing that, you're depriving them of their independence. And this carries on throughout life. I went to visit a, a, a family once and they had an eight year old say, I still tie their shoelaces. I'm like, you what? No, they're my babies. I wanna, I'm like, seriously, you're killing yourself because this child is going to grow up Know that you're always, that can always depend on mom. You go up into the, if they go into uh, high school, university, and they're constantly coming back to mom to do everything for them. They'll enter in a relationship and they'll not be able to be independent. They're always waiting for their partner to make decisions for them. And in the course of, of this, they could get into an abusive relationship because they're constantly being dependent on other people to make decisions for, for them, to, to, to decide what they're going to eat. To, so it is important, it is critical that we promote independence in our children. Our jobs as uh, parents are guides. And we want to create, we want, we want to release them, release them, hold them close, but also with an open hand. Hold them close as in you love them dearly and you want what's best for them, but open your hands and allow them to explore. Children need to take risks. Children need to take risks. Allow them to climb trees. Allow them to jump from, from, from the fence within reason, obviously. But allow them to take some risks. So yeah. it's important <laughs> yeah. that we, <laughs> we give our children the tools that they need to navigate this world. This world is very, very brutal. You cannot cocoon your child. You cannot bring, leave the, keep the child in the bubble, no matter how much you love them. That is, when that love has become too overprotective, it is no longer love. It is maybe even your own needs that you are meeting by hanging on to that child and not allowing them to explore and be free. Yeah, I think that is that is really, really true because parents portray their fears onto their children and that aspect of overprotection comes in and they are doing more damage to the child or the children than promoting that independence because the child actually doesn't have any sense of independence because they know the parents will always be there. I'll just share this little... Um, um, case I, I like stories so i was working with one family and this mom was saying that this child was displaying behaviors and it was it, it was a disorder the, the, the mom thought anyway this child goes to school he's a teenager he goes to school and they do food technology and when he goes he really likes cooking and he's always like one of the first to finish is like chopping the onions, the, opening the tomato cans and doing whatever for the, for the food technology. But then when he's coming home, he takes the recipe and it ends up in his bag. So I asked the mom, what happens with the recipe? Mom said, oh no, I'm so scared. I don't want him to burn himself on the, on the hob and things like that. And I was like, he likes cooking because he told me a number of times that he really likes cooking and he has the pile of recipes in his bag. But because he knows that, that mom doesn't allow him to, to, to cook, he, he, he can't push. So I suggested to mom, what if 
he comes with, or he takes out one of the recipes you agree on. You mom buy the items and let him measure the ingredients. And if he's mixing whatever, getting the, the, the food prepared. And then when it comes to using the hob or the oven, mom, that is your duty now open or put it on because that is where the danger is so he doesn't burn himself and mom was like oh I've never thought of that I said okay do that because it's just something um practical he is still doing the things mom you are not doing it for him but you are there supervising and when he gets to the danger part of using the putting on the hob or the oven that is when you mom you do it believe him and this mom did that a number of times and she was like oh and he, he this this child really really likes it and in that course of the the child preparing the items they were having conversation and it really helped both of them to bond because mm. they, they that relationship was breaking down but that little I mean little things build up relationships and that was really, really helpful for that family. So I thought I'd just throw that one in there. That, that is a great example, Nelly. That is a very good example because like I always say, start young, allow them to explore, allow them to join in, allow them to, to participate in what you're doing because in the long run, they're gonna help you. Now, uh, when I was, uh, like, let me share a story as well. When I was in, still working in Royton, I had this discussion with my manager and a colleague. I don't know how it started, but I said, my kids make me cups of tea. And my colleague said, why are you allowed, asking your kids to make you a cup of tea? If you want to have tea, go and make your own tea. I'm like, no, I live in a community. We live in a household. We all have responsibilities and we all have rights. We're supposed to help one another. If I need a cup of tea, I'll ask my child to go and make me a cup of tea. Oh, what if they burn themselves? What if, I'm like, how are they going to grow? How are they going to learn? Accidents do happen. I'm not saying that you're going to put your child in a dangerous situation on purpose just because you want to teach them something. No, you have to teach them and allow them to learn these things and make mistakes. And so um, we went back and forth, back and forth. And then our manager said, you know what? I wish my parents had taught me this. I wish my mom had taught me this. My mom died when I was 10 and I couldn't even make a cup of tea. My dad couldn't even cook anything. He didn't even know how to operate the washing machine. And we struggled. Why? Because mom did everything in the house. So if your children don't learn, what happens? Worst case scenario, this mom died. So if they don't learn, like I tell my children all the time, if I ask you to do something, you're not doing it for me. You may, at that moment, you may be helping me make a cup of tea. But when you go into your own house, I'm not gonna come there and be making you cups of tea. You're learning for your sake, for your own benefit. If you're learning to clean the floor, you're not learning it for me. I can clean the floor. I have hands. But if I ask you to clean, it is because you need to learn those skills. If I ask you to cook, like you said, with that, with that, that child even went to school and loved it and cooked and I wanted to learn how to cook his ass. If somebody was pulling him to go and cook, he wanted to do it. But then the parents were like, no, 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 cotton wool. No, 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 no. Our job is to love them and release them. So, so, so thank you for, for sharing that because it's important. It's this topic that you chose today was is, is very critical. We need to teach our children independence. And another thing that sometimes gets to me when I visit families is the fact that parents do not want to discipline because oh, I love them too much. <laughs> Seriously, that is not love. You love corrects. That one, you know, I always say love. People talk of love, but there are two kinds of love. Is it the love out of love or the love out of fear? Mm -hmm. Most people love out of fear. 
So then they do things because they want to protect themselves and the thing that they are doing for love. Mm. Yeah, they can say it's for love, but the intention behind it is fear. Mm. So just the, like the case you've said, I mean, we people need to differentiate and really know what their intentions are for the behaviors that they are displaying and the impact it has on in this case, we are talking about our children. Thank you, Nelly. So we have looked at um, what dependency is, what independency is, and we have focused, I uh, really wanted us to focus on promoting independence, really. When you brought this topic, I'm like, good. A lot of times we focus only on the negative side, but today we have really tried to push on how to promote independence in our children. And that is so important. It's good to recognize the signs of dependency so that we can work on and, 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 and build resilience and self-esteem and confidence to be able to say no, to be able to say, no, I will make this decision myself. Let me try and fail. There's nothing wrong with failure. Failing means first attempt at, uh, at, at what living or, or independence or something, but there's an acronym there that since first, first failure is first attempt in learning or living or something like that. But we can, we can make the acronym as we want to suit whatever we want to give in, the, in this particular example. So it's important that we give our children the opportunities to learn, fail, learn from their mistakes, fail again, but get up. Yeah, it yeah. says in the Bible that a righteous man will fall seven times, but he get up. So that is how we are supposed to live, always pushing to get up and move forward. Yeah, that, that's really true. That's really true. Just one thing that I want to add before we finish is, mm -hmm. you know, it is very, very common now to find people who are needy. Mm -hmm. And you see, needy people look for needy people. And then it's just that circle of, Dependence and codependency. Codependency, <laughs> problems, just going in circle and circle and circle. So as parents, let's start with our children from very young ages. Even if your child, you've not been promoting independence with your children, it is not late. Start anywhere, even if the children are whatever age, as long as you know now, start. Mm -hmm. But know that when you start, the children will resist because it's new to them. But then have that open conversation and tell them why things need to change for their good, for your good, and for the family's good. So start somewhere. So and eventually you. the society and the community. Oh, yes. Because we want responsible citizens. We don't mm -hmm. want citizens who, are, who feel entitled and depend mm. on the state all the time. You want independent people, strong, yeah. independent uh, um, citizens. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for, for, for today. And it's been a pleasure having, or having this topic today. If you have any comments after, just put and we'll respond to you. And again, if you have a particular topic that you want us to talk about, get in contact with us and share that topic with us. If you want to be a panel, a panelist, get in contact with us and we want to, let's, let's talk about it, that crucial topics that we always avoid. And one thing with this family Grow Together show is we touch the topics that most people avoid, but they are very, very critical in our society and we need to talk about them. Some people will not want to hear them because again, they're in denial, they are avoiding, but the problem or the issues are there. So let's talk about it. This is the age of truth. So many things were not spoken, but now they're spoken. So we need to keep questioning and asking, even things that we didn't ask before, we didn't even know that we could ask, this is the time to open up, have that open conversation, ask questions and not just be doing things because you were told to do it and you don't even know the reason. So let's get on it. 
Thank you, Nelly. <clears throat> Thank you, everyone who's watched tonight. And we hope that you are going to join the conversation. Let's continue this in the comment section. Now, if you want to find out more about what we do, you can visit our website on handhandcommunitycic.com. I repeat, www.handhandcommunitycic.com. Or you can send us a direct message on Facebook, find us on Twitter somewhere in the Twitter sphere. <laughs> <laughs> and have a lovely rest of the week, and we will see you next week. Thank Bye. you so much, and have a great evening. Bye.